It is my uh, great pleasure to introduce Jamie Quattro. Uh, Jamie is a, an American fiction writer. Her de debut story collection, I want to show you more, uh, published in 2013, was a New York Times notable, notable book, NPR Best Book of 2013, uh, In the Next Pick, uh, the Opera Magazine Summer Reading Pick, and the New York Times Editor's uh, Choice. Uh, she's a con contributing editor for the magazine, magazine Ox Oxford American, and uh, she teaches at uh, Sewani, uh, the University of the, of the South. Um, Fire Sermon is her debut uh, novel, and it has just been reviewed in the New York Times, Times Book Review and The Atlantic. <clears throat> uh, main character of, of uh, the novel is Maggie, She's a writer, a wife, a mother, and a completely devoted uh, Christian. But she falls in love with a man who is not her husband and start questioning, starts questioning her, uh, the ways of her faith, her devotion, and uh, her love. As uh, stated in San Francisco Chronicle, uh, adultery may be a tale as old as time, but uh, Quattro's take is freshly urgent as she grapples with themes of desire, sin, commitment, guilt, and uh, renunciation while writing frankly about bo both marital and extramarital sex. And uh, Claire Lachette from O Magazine uh, says, Quattro's novel, full of vivid mer mercurial prose, breathes new life into the subject and sets it gloriously ablaze. So uh, without further ado, please help me in welcoming Jamie Quattro at Politics and Prose. Thank you so much. Thanks to Politics and Prose for hosting me. Um, and thanks for coming out in the rain. Um, I've never been to Washington DC. Well, I take that back. I've been to Washington DC once before when I was nine years old. Um, my parents took me to see the White House. Jimmy Carter was president. And all I want, I thought maybe I would glimpse Amy Carter. That was the big fun. And I remember eating astronaut ice cream. And that's my experience so far of DC. So thank you for welcoming me back and giving me a more literary experience. Uh, I'll tell you just a little bit about the genesis of Fire Sermon, kind of how I came to write it, uh, and then read to you for a little bit, and then we'll have some questions. So I, um, after my story collection came out, I, my agent sold my next two books to my publisher, and one of them was a novel called Two-Step Devil. And I was working on this novel, and it's a, it's a long, kind of plot-driven story of a backwoods, end times, outsider artist, prophetic man who rescues a sex trafficking victim. I got really bogged down in research, and I started cheating on that novel, um, sneaking off to write little passages um, about something that had been in the back of my mind, which was when my grandmother died at a very um, old age, 96, we found out she'd left behind a huge stack of unsent love letters and another stack of letters that she'd received from this mysterious man. And I'd always wondered, you know, what was the story here? Not, you know, 96 years. And she never was married to anyone other than my grandfather. Uh, so that had been playing around the back of my mind. So I started, I started sneaking off, cheating on my contracted novel uh, to write about what I thought was going to be just something private. And it ended up being another novel. I got to about 100 pages and... <laughs> I emailed my agent and confessed. I said, I, you know, I've been cheating on this. And she read the pages and said, keep up the affair. So I finished this novel and turned it in. And that became, that became my debut novel, Fire Sermon. Uh, as sh she mentioned, it's the story of a long-term marriage between Maggie and Thomas uh, with a kind of hot-blooded physical affair right in the center of it. Uh, and I'm not giving anything away because that affair happens on the first page. Um, the novel is told in a nonlinear fashion, so uh, the affair becomes a kind of vortex around which the rest of the novel swirls temporally. So you're moving all through time, all the way back into Maggie's father's childhood and all the way forward to the end of their lives and to the end of time itself. The novel's told in hybrid forms, so there's poetry, emails, texts, letters, email. Uh, there's a sermon, there are kind of pseudo-therapy sessions that could also be a dialogue with the self. There's first person, second person, and third person, and omniscient narration. So if I haven't scared you off, <laughs> I hope you'll stay and listen to a bit of uh, Fire Sermon. 
set my timer here, make sure that I... And I'm going to read right from the beginning, so I don't have to tell you anything about anything. Can everyone hear me, by the way? Okay. Shall we walk back? James asked outside the theater. Chicago, April 2017. The air chilly, the sky cleared off after an evening of rain. We'd left the film a half hour after it began, a poorly written, poorly acted farce. Now the sidewalk was empty. Tiny lights strung between gas lamps and storefronts created a glittery canopy above us. Charming, he'd said when we arrived earlier, a part of the city neither of us had seen. I was still in my clothes from that morning, white sweater, pencil skirt, ankle boots with zippers, high heeled. I'll call a car, I said. Your hotel's on the way to mine. We rode in silence, the wet asphalt glowing red and green at stoplights. When we pulled up to his hotel, James turned to face me, adjusting his glasses. Okay, he said. Text me when you're safely back. He leaned over to brush my cheek with his lips. But when the bellhop opened the rear door, he didn't get out. He sat looking ahead, rubbing a hand up and down, up and down his thigh. Both of us, 45, born in the same year, four months apart. Both married to our spouses for 23 years. Two similarities in what had come to seem in the three years we'd known one another, a cosmically ordained accumulation. Born and raised in the desert southwest, allergic to peanuts, students of the Christian mystics and quantum theory and Moby Dick. Children the same ages and genders, older girl, younger boy, and 96-year-old grandmothers who still lived independently. In the end, it was this last fact that undid me, the longevity in our respective genes. The safe way to let yourself fall in love with someone who isn't your spouse? Imagine the life you might have together after both your spouses have passed away. What I mean is, darling, when I made love with you that night, I was making love with the magnificent old man I knew you would become. Can I help with any bags? The bellhop finally said. You're at the Hyatt, James said to me. Yes, I said. Take us to the Hyatt, he said to the driver, and pulled the door shut. But this story begins where others end. A boy and a girl in love, a wedding, a happily ever after. Malibu, June. A bride and four attendants on a grassy bluff above the Pacific. The morning is overcast, typical along the coast. The diffuse light, ideal for photographs. The bride's dress is raw silk in antique ivory and appears backlit against the slate of ocean. Sweetheart neckline, cap sleeves, full skirt with a train that will later gather into a bustle. She cradles her bouquet like an infant. Six dozen roses in various stages of bloom, blush pink. The groomsmen, fraternity brothers, have already been photographed. They wait inside the chapel, where in half an hour the ceremony will begin. They wear gray tuxedos with ascot ties and slick black shoes. Three including the groom, have the same round tortoiseshell glasses. Down the coast, at the country club in Pacific Palisades, the caterers are assembling the cake. Five tiers frosted in a basket weave pattern, with real ivy and roses trailing down one side. The bride has selected a different flavor for each tier. Buttercream, chocolate, spice, red velvet. The top layer is white chocolate with raspberry cream filling. It will be placed in the couple's freezer for their first anniversary. Until one night while they're out, the bride's younger brother, stoned, and knowing nothing about such traditions, will eat the whole thing. The centerpieces are fish bowls with ivy and roses identical to those on the cake. They sit in a refrigerated van on Pacific Coast Highway, north of Sunset. The driver's stuck in beach traffic, but there's plenty of time. The bride's brother, age 15, is tasked with decorating the limo. Just married, he writes over and over in soap paint. 
How many times is too many? He draws a wedding bell, but it comes out looking like a top hat, so he wipes it away. He reaches into his pocket to feel the rings. Today is the first time he's heard himself introduced to other people as a man. Margaret's little brother, the best man. The bride's sister is a senior in high school and bewildered by her role. The other bridesmaids seem to know what to talk about, how to look and act. She wonders why her sister didn't ask one of them to be the maid of honor. She hardly knows her sister now. When she'd left home, she wore frosty pink lipstick and bleached her naturally auburn hair. Now, she wears no makeup and has let her hair go dark. She talks of fellowships and stipends and moving to Princeton, where in the fall she'll start grad school. Her fiancé, husband, will work in Manhattan. You'll have to come visit us, her sister said. It's student housing, converted army barracks, nothing fancy. But we'll have a spare room. The bride's mother is 44, her father 46. Both look young enough to be the ones getting married. Delight, pride, tears. Their oldest daughter graduated summa cum laude in three years, marrying the first boy she ever seriously dated. So mature for her age, so self-possessed. And now this presidential fellowship. She'll be one of the youngest PhDs in the country when she's finished. An expert in something called post-colonial theory. And what will her husband do, guests ask. A job in New York City, her parents tell them consulting firm, financial services. Inside the chapel, the wedding guests gather. Shuffle of programs, subdued talk, the organ playing Handel and Mozart, sotto voce. The ushers, also fraternity brothers, lead the three widowed grandmothers and then the mothers down the aisle. The groom's mother uses a cane, the stepfather walking just behind. The groom's parents divorced when he was three and his father was not invited to the wedding. The groom is an only child, an orphan for all intents and purposes, he's told the bride over the years. Today he'll get a new family, lawyer father-in-law, middle school principal mother-in-law, two siblings, two hale grandmothers. He's a good listener, the bride told her parents. You should see him with children. You should see him play the guitar. I realize you're getting the raw end of this deal, he'd said to the bride the day of their engagement. I'm getting you, she said. The groom is agnostic, but it doesn't bother her. When it comes to his actions, he's a better Christian than most Christians she knows. In fact, he is, she can think of no better word, malleable. Alters his demeanor to meet the needs of others. His voice acquires a tenderness when he speaks to his mother on the phone, as if he's tucking her in. His thick hair, the way his lips part and press against his, and his tongue presses against his bottom teeth before he speaks, a deep thoughtfulness about him. Thomas knows how to handle Margaret, her mother has said to close friends and a few relatives. He respects our beliefs, and he knows how to put up with, well, a certain volatility in her temperament. She'll go hard after something, and once she gets it, no longer care. A hammered gold necklace she pestered me to buy for a year. She wore it twice and gave it away. The groomsmen are lined up, the minister front and center. The bridesmaids come in too fast, but the flower girl, three-year-old daughter of the bride's cousin, takes her time. From her basket, she removes petals singly, squats to place each onto the fabric runner as if affixing stickers. No one hurries her. She's precious, cameras flash. Finally, the pause. Hush. The silence grows uncomfortable until the groom's mother grabs her cane and pushes herself up. The organ notes blast, and with a great creaking and rustling, the guests rise and turn. Only then does the bride's mother realize she forgot to stand first, the one thing required of her this day. When the bride appears, the groom staggers. He reaches a hand to steady himself against the best man who doesn't notice. He's thinking about the rings. Does the bride give the groom the ring first, or is it the reverse? The father smiles to the audience, looking right, left, white teeth flashing against his smooth, darkly tanned skin, the bride's face misty in an iridescent veil. Who gives this woman? 
In his practiced courtroom voice, the father makes a practiced speech. This is a moment of great honor and pride in the life of any father, but it is a particular moment of honor and pride for me and for her mother to give our firstborn daughter in marriage today in the sight of the Lord and these many witnesses. He lifts the veil and kisses a bright cheek. The bride turns and hands the bouquet to her sister, who until this moment didn't know that holding the flowers would be her responsibility. She doesn't know what to do with her own bouquet. She mashes the two together and clutches them against her chest. A short homily, traditional vows, the exchange of rings. Brother produces from pocket, feels immediately hungry, starving in fact, wonders if there will be actual meat or just chicken at the reception. Lighting of the unity candle, two flames becoming one, leave and cleave. The groom surprises the bride and sings to her, a groomsman handing him a ukulele. Laughter. Tears, the kiss, a short one, and the organ charges out the recessional triplets. The couple exits arm in arm, waving to guests. But the bride has forgotten her bouquet. The sister must walk back down the aisle with it. Outside the chapel, she discovers the bride and groom have been whisked off for photos. She puts the bouquet beneath the stone bench to keep it safe. But in the flurry of hugs and kisses and photographs, the confused clambering into limousines, the flowers are left behind. An hour into the reception, the bride realizes her mistake. She asks a friend to go back and look, but by the time the friend gets to the chapel, the bouquet is gone. Tucked into the dethorned roses was a linen handkerchief from, one of the bride's, from the bride's paternal grandmother, the color of a robin's egg. Something old, borrowed and blue, hand embroidered in white, D-T-H. Whose initials, Gran? she'd asked. Oh, just someone I used to know, her grandmother said. Twenty-five years later, when the grandmother dies of congestive heart failure, three months on an oxygen tank, how it hurts were her last words. The 46-year-old granddaughter will receive a padded envelope in the mail. Inside will be 11 handkerchiefs, each identical to the one she lost on her wedding day, and a letter in her grandmother's wavering cursive. June 13th. 1993. My darling Mags, I've just returned from your wedding. What a lovely ceremony. And I adore Thomas. We all do. He'll be a wonderful husband. Your mother says you lost the hanky. No matter. As you see, I have more. His name was Donald Trent Harper. I met him the summer I stayed at Ruth's Lake House. Do you remember Auntie Ruth from Michigan? the one who always wore jeweled cords on her spectacles. Don was a horseman. He was 27, 10 years older than I was. That summer, we fell in love and decided to get married. When I got back to Cleveland, we had an argument over the telephone. Something silly, I don't remember what. But I was rude. I insulted him and hung up. I was too proud to be the one to call back and apologize. I wanted him to call first. I waited a year but he never called. I married your Grandpa Jack to spite Don. And when Jack died so young, I didn't remarry. Not because, as I always told your father, I could never love anyone as much as I loved Jack, but because I hoped Donald, Donald and I might someday find one another again, which of course we never did. Well, my darling, so now you know. I embroidered one hanky a month the year I waited for the telephone to ring. I should like it very much if you kept them. Perhaps they'll remind you to always be the one to call back first. Loving you, Gran. P.S. I trust you won't share this with your father. There's no harm in his believing I only ever loved your grandfather. I did love him in my own way. Cosmically ordained, foolish, the way lovers scaffold passion with symbology, constructing a joint past which seems, even after a few hours immemorial, let us sing the litany of events that transpired before the moment we met. Love's Old Testament. They recur to it often. Remember this, remember that. Israelites in the desert, telling one another the old, old stories. How foolish we were, I tell myself now, hoping someday the word will sound true. James saw me first, the first time we met in person. July 2014, the conference in Nashville. We'd been writing to one another for a year. In the reception room, a table was laid out with fruit and pastries, coffee and sweet tea. 
From across the room, I heard him say my name. Maggie. There you are, I thought. Here you are in my home state. He was wearing a navy button-down, khaki shorts, loafers with no socks. My traveling shoes, he said later when he took them off. I tripped over the table leg to get to him. He stood waiting, one hand on his hip, the other holding a folder with his agenda inside. I felt he wanted to watch me approach to study the way I moved. I imagined he felt that any movement on his end would dull his pleasure in watching. The look on his face was one I would become familiar with whenever we were together. Amusement on the surface, admiration beneath, a kind of ease, something already understood. We belong to one another. I shook his hand. I've been looking for you everywhere, he said. His bottom teeth were crooked, pleasingly so. I've been around, I said. It's nice to meet you in person, finally. Likewise, he said, though a bit surreal. Are you coming to my talk? Of course. I wouldn't miss it. And after, he said. I'm free all afternoon, I said. What's on your agenda? You're my agenda, he said. I'll stop there. Sixteen minutes. <laughs> I'm getting it down. Um, we can be really intimate. This is a really small crowd. Do you guys have any questions about the book or about writing in general or anything that might occur to you? It sounds like you broke a lot of rules that mm -hmm. uh, as someone who just finished a writing program, you get a lot of rules about what to do and what not to do. So I'm just curious, how did you make some of those decisions about point of view, for example, mm -hmm. and know when it was working? Yeah. Where did you, where did you study? Uh, Hopkins. Okay. That's a great program. Congratulations. You're finished? Congratulations. That's exciting. So I'm not a believer in rules at all. Um, I think you can do anything you want to if it's good. Um, <laughs> I think for every rule that somebody puts forth in a workshop, you, there's probably some famous writer who's, who's broken that rule. Uh, as far as how I decide which, you know, points of view to use and what were you thinking about point of view shifts as one of the rules that was broken? Yeah. 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 Um, I think that each work that comes to an author, whether it's a short story or a novel or a poem, dictates its form based on the emotional reality of, of the characters involved and the emotional reality of the, you know, kind of the situation that the characters are in. Um, so in Fire Sermon in particular, and this isn't something I think of beforehand, like, hmm, what's the emotional reality and let me structure it that way. But you're, you're in a mind, you're in a particular mind for, for a space of, you know, months, years. And this is a mind in conflict. This is a mind divided. Um, pulled toward her husband, pulled toward her lover, pulled toward her children, pulled toward her God. So you have all these different directions the mind is going, so the prose tends to, I think, probably follow that. That's my best guess. <laughs> Does that kind of answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Are you, any other writers here? That, I know Bill, Bill and I were at Sewanee together. Yes. And Bill has a great novel. Um, remind me, the baseball. Dodgers, yes, really big, yes, <laughs> another famous author, yeah. Well, if there are no, oh, oh good, okay. I have two questions, they're not related. Um, following, though, on hers about style, yeah. are there other writers that you had read recently mm -hmm. that had a style that either gave you permission or that you followed or looking at? And I say this just because I just started Lincoln and the Bardo. Yeah which um, has a very different style. Yeah, so great I was wondering style. if you had any, um, anything that you had read that brought that to you. Yeah, attention. that's a great question. Um, first of all, Lincoln and the Bardo, I mean, George Saunders is unbelievable. He's one of the best, most brilliant short story writers working, and then he takes the novel form and you know, does this kind of incantatory um, musical thing with, with what he's doing with the little tags afterwards. And, it's an amazing book. Uh, I was, um, I, I think I was influenced a lot by James Salter's Light Years, mm -hmm. um, one of my all-time favorite novels, top five for sure. And there's a watery quality, I think, to his prose. It's, it's this fluid, it's almost an experience that washes over you reading him more than some, you know, say, what is his, pro, what is Light Years about? It's more of a whole experience. I'm, I've been really influenced by stylists that their, their meaning or their plot can't be separated from the actual experience of the prose itself. 
Um, I was also reading Maggie Nelson's Bluettes, which um, I reference in here quite often. And her style, you know, she has these very short. Do you know, do you know Maggie Nelson's Bluettes? I do not. Um, it, you think it's a book about the color blue, but as you begin to read, you realize it's about, it's about a man and a lost love. So I think those two books were probably the, the most direct influences on Fire Sermon. And then holistically, there were some others. I, I deal a lot with the intersection of theology and sexuality in this, in this novel. So a lot of reading of theology, and um, uh, St. Augustine's Confessions, <laughs> a lot of C.S. Lewis, uh, yes. Julian of Norwich, the medieval Christian mystics. So those were some of the influences. Thank you. And that leads right exactly to my second question, was. Clearly, if you're at Sewanee and University of the South, mm -hmm. and you have a very Christian character, can you talk mm -hmm. more about um, how you, what you took from your own experience, mm -hmm. or what you see at Sewanee, um, and in building this character and her Christianity? Sure, that's a great question too. Um, so, my work in my first book, particularly six linked stories in that book, and then this novel uh, really do push at the intersection of sexuality and spirituality. Um, for anybody who's raised in a strict evangelical home as I was, those two things are disparate. Those two things never, you know, this one is over here and this one is over here and never the twain shall meet. Um, but then you read the Bible and it's like full of sex. And <laughs> there's passages about Christ's love for the church being like a groom's love for his bride. Um, and in fact, there's so much talk about God's love for his people in sexual language. So as I got older and kind of moved away from that background, I started, I think, becoming sort of obsessed with, well, how are these two things lined up? Even etymologically, if you look at the word ecstasy, you know, ek, out, stasis, to stand, to stand outside oneself, and yet, Everything we know that produces an ecstatic experience is located within the body. Uh, sex, psych psych psychotropic drugs, exercise, breathing exercises, breathing and meditative exercises. So it seems that there's this link between the body and matter and access to divinity. And so I think that's where my work is kind of going with that intersection. And I'm not, I'm not sure why that's an obsession other than to say it was something forbidden to me. Um, I also know a lot about long-term marriage. I've been married a very long time. So those two obsessions, you know, I can, I can write about long-term marriage. I can't, there's some experiences I don't have firsthand access to, but I do have firsthand access to that. So that's the little, that's the little nuclear fusion, I think, there. <laughs> JB, first, congratulations. The Thanks, Bill. book is beautiful and, and it's gotten such great reviews. And I want to say that like a week ago, um, somebody tweeted out after I suspect you'd read somewhere or, or maybe not, maybe just because somebody was tweeting out things you'd said. Um, the line about a novel's form responding to the, I'm going to blow it, but, but to the mind yeah. of a character, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, which I immediately wrote down because um, I teach writing myself and I yeah. thought wow what a great way of of kind of working with you know Forster and the elements of fiction mm -hmm. and and what struck me about I mean I'm curious if you have anything more to say about mm -hmm. about that I, what struck me is is the really cool way that that puts it would sort of it moves us away from a model where conflict and and crisis right, and resolution yeah. and complication are our are our movers and shakers and towards an idea of of a novel's engine or structure mm -hmm. being more human right? Or, right or at least more character based um uh and i'm i'm curious whether you whether you think well okay then ultimately that character has to run on old sort of plot-driven conflict mm -hmm. um, models, let's say, engines, energy, mm -hmm. or whether you think, no, any, any well-rendered character is going to have, you know, however you'd put it, contradictions, energies, desires, mm -hmm. that then ultimately just unroll. I'm sorry, this is kind of a theoretical right. question. No, but, and but, it's really it's a really um, good question. I, I love the I love the way of looking at plot that way. Yeah, no, I do too. Was it Fitzgerald who said start with a character and before you know it you have a plot, start with a plot and before you know it you have nothing? I think that's Fitzgerald. <laughs> I could be misquoting, but I, I completely agree with you. And I and I also have to say that, you know, every short story I've written, everything I've ever drafted 
has been sound-based. It starts with a sentence. It starts with a line of dialogue. It starts with an image, and you follow that into the larger thing. It never starts with plot or you know, some engine that you then affix your, you know, your, your devices to. Uh, so the music is different every time. And just following you know, sentence to sentence in the music, I think it, it, the, the meaning and the plot bubble up through that. Fire Sermon specifically, like I say, I was writing all of these pages not really knowing how they came together, where they went. Once I had everything, once I had the real estate in front of me, then I needed to figure out, okay, how, what's the emotional arc? So though the time, the, t the temporal um, time frame was swirling like this and back and forth, I did want to have a linear arcs of emotionally. So that's in the revision stage, right? When you have all your, you have everything in front of you, all your cards on the table. And I don't know if that's what you experience too, but in the drafting, I try not to think too much about plot structure. How's this going to you know, look on the page? What are my sections? What, where are the chapter breaks or anything like that? So yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, when, okay. I guess last. Um, okay. Another process question. Yeah, sure. So when you were um, doing your maybe second draft or the revision, mm -hmm. um, in terms of when information was released, did you find that it was very different from the first draft? Like, how different, I guess, was the second draft from the first draft? Right, you're talking about the withholding of information yeah. for, like, suspense and narrative tension, and, yeah. I always, talk, I always talk to my students about withholding of information, because it seems to be, like, especially beginning students will tend to think that that's the way to get your reader to keep going, is to, like, withhold information, but that's... It, it, that, again, I think for me, that's something that comes later is figuring out what to withhold, what to, what to give out. And in my, and my case, in this novel, I gave everything away on, on the very first page. <laughs> so really, this is a more musical experience. It wasn't about, um, you know, keeping things back and revealing things later. There is a revelation at the end that surprised me. That's another thing. If you're not surprised writing your book, your reader's not gonna be surprised. They'll see it all coming. So you, you can't know too much is I think the basic lesson I try to give my students. There's a great essay by Donald Barthelme called Not Knowing, kind of a credo essay. Um, <laughs> I make all my students read it. And it's just about the, it's how essential it is not to know too much about what you're writing so that those organic things can happen and take you by surprise. Hmm. So I haven't ever written a book length nonfiction, but I do, I do write essays. I have a very different process. Usually they're assigned essays for magazines. Um, I'm much more able to outline. And I've talked to friends who write nonfiction and that seems to be the case too because they're giving pitches that have, you know, this is exactly how the book is gonna go. Here's a couple sample chapters. Um, Though, I will say, once that's all laid out and, and then the book is in process, within that structure, you have to, I think you do also have to be open to surprises. And then as that chapter or that essay, whatever it is you're working on, takes shape and you kind of have it in front of you, then you can pare back or add. But I do think there should, don't you? Do you write nonfiction? <laughs> but you know how it is, right? The magic happens on the page. You could think you're going to be saying one thing and you start writing and you're, you know, five, six, seven sentences in and suddenly you're, you're saying something else. And it's, it's not like you planned that. It was, it was the generative act of putting words on the page that, that made those surprises happen. And, and again, it's, I'll, beginning students always want to sit and think and think and think and figure out what they're going to say and like, here's my story and I've got it all figured out and then go say it. And that's just not how it works. It is not how it works. It's, you got to go sit down and, and let the sentences take you and, and see what happens and be surprised. So I do think it applies to nonfiction, just maybe a little less so. Yeah. For me, it is. For me, it is just because you, you, have a, you do have a point you're trying to make or an assignment you're trying to fulfill or a topic that you're trying to address. Um, maybe not memoir as much. You know, talking about memoir, that's a whole different beast. I've never attempted memoir. But yeah, like, a, like a, a, an informational nonfiction work, I would think so. Well, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate you coming out. And uh, I'll sign your books. <laughs>